out my window. I'm sorry I'm distracted. There's a deer running down the street <laughs> outside my window. And my wife gets mad when I say we live out in the country, but I just looked out the window and there's a deer running down the street. So we do live out in the country. Meg McPeak, what's uh, number one on your Apple Music playlist this morning? I actually have like four songs that are all within the same metrics. I have a rotation system. It depends on my mood that morning that I play mm -hmm. specific songs. So it rotates between uh, Tina Turner, Brianna, or uh, Beyonce, uh, Nipsey Hussle, and uh, Biggie. So they're all basically the exact same metrics. So it just depends on my mood. This morning was Nipsey. But that's what I was gonna ask you, but which specific song popped up this morning? That's the thing that I, they're on such a heavy rotation that they're all, they're all the same. <laughs> I don't skip songs. <laughs> Oh, okay, so you're rotating albums. Yes, yes. Or you just go rotate by artist, regardless of I album. Ro I rotate by artist, and it's just like playlist populates because I put it on shuffle. There we go. Okay, and and today it's Nipsey. Today it was Nipsey. Okay, because uh, life is a marathon; it's not a sprint. Good stuff. Exactly. Uh, Dave Zirin, you're Apple Music or Spotify guy? Uh, Apple Music, and I am not paid for that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm I'm not, I'm branding. Not yet, anyway. If, if yet. we get a few more viewers, maybe Dave, we can make those dreams come true. Yeah. Uh, so what popped up? What did what did Apple Music uh, feed you today? Well, look, here's the deal. You know, I live in the D.C. area, but you know, born and raised Brooklyn, New York City, and all I had to hear about all weekend from all of my Brooklyn people was that this past weekend, DMX's funeral, and there were more motorcycles in Brooklyn for the procession <laughs> than have ever been in New York City at one time ever. That's not scientific, but it's not it's not Sturgis, South Dakota. You don't usually see a procession <laughs> of, of motors of just like badass motorbikes throughout Brooklyn. And that was all for DMX. And so I've got Who We Be on Apple Music, Rough Riders Anthem. I'm just, you know, just feeling Brooklyn by extension this Monday morning. Man, and imagine like all these guys in their 40s and 50s having to uh, convince their wives that they had to take the motorcycle back out for one more spin. I just hope these dudes popping wheelies still have that spatial awareness after all oh. these years to land those things <laughs> safely. Grim. I'm sure they were fine, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You know, my favorite DMX song, like, and it's very on brand for me, is uh, How It's Going Down. Like as a guy that's a, a, a slow jam connoisseur, how it's going down to me is 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 Pete DMX, and it's the one that's kind of kind of cuts against his brand, but that's the one I like. So um, this morning I, I'm a I'm a spot. I guess I'm the only Spotify person on this panel. That's cool. So every day Spotify throws me six playlists, and I usually depending like Megan says, depending on my mood, we'll see which one I pull up. But uh, playlist one, track one today was Mint Condition. What kind of man would I be? Which. Um, <laughs> They went to school in Minnesota. You know Mint Condition. Yeah, like I just think waking up to band. Mint Condition is funny to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, so people think of that, and you're like, well, if that algorithm is just feeding you all these slow jams from the 1990s, is that all you listen to? And I'm like, pretty much. Mm. <laughs> so there you go. And, uh, and I do actually, like in the book I'm writing, uh, there is a chapter called The 90-Minute Slow Jam Tape, where I talk about uh, slow jam tapes, like building a slow jam tape the old school way when you had two sides of a cassette tape, 45 and 45. And what would you do? And what criteria would you use to put slow jams on this tape? And, and that song figures prominently because it kind of, uh, it discusses the ethics of, of partner theft, right? What kind of man would I be? Some girl is trying to steal Stokely from his girlfriend. Uh, and in Mint Condition's next single, Stokely is trying to steal some somebody's unhappy girlfriend from her boyfriend, but there are ethics to this. There's rules to the game and there's rules uh, to everything we're doing. Hey guys, welcome back to Bring It In, season two, episode three. I'm your host, Morgan Campbell. I'm doing it with the best panel in the business, Brooklyn's own Dave Zirin, Hamilton's own Megan McPeak. As usual, we have uh, a full roster of topics. Speaking of rules, we have the Olympics. Rule 50, they've... <laughs> Not really a change to the rule, and somehow that is the news. And I promise you, our discussion about Rule 50 will be more interesting than uh, any of the news articles you've read about Rule 50. We're going to talk about how COVID-19 still overhangs and underpins so much of what we're doing in the sports world and so much of what we think we're going to be able to do uh, 
as this year goes on. We're also going to find out who's in and out on uh, athlete brand disruption. Megan McPeak is going to give us a, a, a way too early prediction. And we're going to celebrate uh, Dave Stradamus, the prophet, who correctly predicted that the <laughs> That the foot that uh, European footies Super League would fall apart at the seams once the fans got into it. Uh, but first up, Rule 50. Um, and if you're not familiar with Rule 50, uh, don't feel bad. Most of us aren't. Think about these like Olympic rules that, that govern what athletes can say and what they can't say. None of us are familiar with these rules. The only people that know these rules are the people that make them. And then the athletes find out about these rules usually when they break them and then they get in trouble. But Rule 50 deals with. Uh, athletes protesting at the Olympics. If you think of, again, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, that is a blatant violation of Rule 50, and they got expelled from the game. Uh, 50 years later, they're inducted into the U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame because, again, you, uh, the, the people in power get to see what side of history they want to be on, and do they want to be on the side of history that upheld white supremacy? No, they don't. Okay. John Carlos and Tommy Smith, you guys actually were right. Welcome to the Hall of Fame. Um, and so... I, my read is that heading into this year, like after George Floyd, after all the protests and after the way all these mainstream North American, not just North American pro sports league, I can turn on super league rugby league from England and they have a black lives matter moment of silence before the game. Like after all these sports leagues embraced um, the spirit for right now, we'll call it a spirit of protests. What would the Olympics do heading into um, 2021 with the 2020 games? And what the Olympics have said is, uh, protest and if I get some of the details wrong, Dave, I hope you can uh, correct me. Protests are still forbidden. Uh, you can wear a T-shirt with like some of these neutral phrases like equality, um, equality is one uh, 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 progress, something like that. But in terms of making a political statement or a protest, that is still forbidden. Um, and this upholding of the rule made news. But Dave, like, what I don't understand is what people expected would be different this time around. Like if those actions weren't technically legal before, why would they change now? Well, I think people expected a change, a change that did not occur because the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee is so powerful within the International mm -hmm. Olympic Committee, especially with uh, some of the recent leadership changes in the IOC. And it was expected that since the USOPC said, well, we actually support our athletes' right to protest, that you might see that also happen in the International Olympic Committee level. But can, can I give my take on this as well, if I may? Absolutely. That's I, why you're here. Yeah, I know. I feel you. I just, you asked a specific question, didn't want to eat up all the oxygen. I, I got to <laughs> say, though, that, that what the IOC is putting forward as justification is as fake as the best actor voting in the Oscars last night. They said 70% of athletes say that they want no politics on the podium, but then you had athletic unions and organizations across the globe say that they weren't consulted. And so I'm, I want to know where that very rounded, very media-friendly number, 70%, even comes from. They've, they've delivered no actual data to support that. But you know what? I'm glad that the IOC is exactly who we thought they were. I'm absolutely glad about that because I believe that protest is about risk. Protest is about rebellion. And if we want Thank protest you, you. to be effective, then we should say that Olympic athletes don't need and should not seek the IOC's approval to protest. And if they do it as an act of rebellion and not as an act of either branding or they're doing it because the IOC is now putting itself forward as protest friendly, as a way to appeal to young viewers and all the rest of it, it's going to be more effective. So the IOC, they're showing us who they, who we thought they were and who they've always been. And the athletes now have risk that accompanies protests. And I actually think that's a good thing. Well, exactly, Dave. Like, like we again in the mainstream sports media, we get we get snookered by these uh, by these semantic games so easily. And people use protests and demonstrations as if they are synonyms, and they're not. Because the thing that made uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith so special is that it was so unexpected, and it was so um, heartfelt, spontaneous in the sense that they didn't have like months and years of planning into this one thing. They were like, yo, we got some gloves. How are we going to, how are we going to demonstrate when we win, <laughs> when we get on the podium, which is audacious. This is the best people in the world. And these guys are like, we're not even, there's not even a doubt about whether or not we're hitting the podium. We're hitting the podium. What are we going to do when we get there? But um, 
what we saw a lot of this summer, again, is the leagues uh, embrace this type of messaging. It becomes less of a protest and more of a demonstration. I mention this all the time. Uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith said, we're going to get up on this podium. We're going to raise the black fist, no matter what happens afterward, no matter if the, IO, the IOC says it's against the rules, no matter if they send us home from Mexico City, we're going to go up here, we're going to make this point. And so we had this summer was the absolute opposite of that. When the NHL says to Matt Dumba, here is a microphone, you take the microphone with our brand on the mic flag and say what you want. Uh, about systemic racism. Those are two very different things. One group of people is taking a risk. The other group of people is doing a very safe thing. So if, 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 if the question is protest, like if someone really wants to protest and someone feels it's that important, then they're going to do it regardless of whether or not there are consequences. Like, again, that's part of the whole point. Like you're doing this uh, to make the point regardless of the consequences and not because you think you're going to get a pat on the back from the person uh, that handed you the microphone. So Megan McPeak, um, what do you make of this idea that 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 these leagues can legislate not just uh, not just demonstrations that they co-sign on, but like authentic protests? I think it's very interesting. And to Dave's point, when you look at the IOC, this isn't a surprise. Like they they've been who they are for decades. So them saying, okay, you can you know you can protest, but we're gonna give you this window where and when you can do it. They're basically turning this into a dictatorship and no longer a democracy. Mind you, the IOC was never a democracy. It's always been a dictatorship, so this shouldn't surprise anybody. But the fact that they're trying to control when and where athletes protest, I think, is them trying to control the narrative and keep the games about the games and not about what the world is experiencing specifically, you know, as we know in the United States and even, you know, in other countries, depending on what they're facing. We have seen an uprising across the globe, not just about racism, about human rights, about civil rights. And it's not just in, in the United States. So I think this is the IOC's way of trying to control the narrative surrounding the Olympic Games because they're under so much scrutiny, not just with this, but as well, too, when you look at the COVID-19 virus and how people feel about the Olympic Games continuing with COVID still, you know, alive and well. And I think this is their way to control one narrative and control what the athletes do. But I truly hope that there is a group of athletes or one singular athlete that says, you know what, to hell with the IOC and what they want to control me to do. I'm going to protest when and where I want to, because that's truly where you see, as you mentioned, Morgan, the risk and the reward. You can't have a reward and you can't have change if there's no risk taken. And if they're only demonstrating when they're allowed to, then what are they truly standing for and speaking for? And that's not saying that these athletes don't stand or speak for anything, but if they're only doing it when they're allowed to, then where's the, the conversation going? Because we know when the conversation can be had. It's when you do something, as you mentioned, that's rebellious and against the grain and against the rules as to when they're supposed to be doing it. That's when the conversation happens because I've said it once and I'm going to, to continue to say it again. Change doesn't happen if we don't have uncomfortable conversations. And if we control when the uncomfortable conversations happen, then we're not actually trying to have change. And I think this is what the IOC is trying to do. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Dave, are you going to say something? Go ahead. Just one last point is the Olympics provide a unique opportunity because the global gaze is on these events. The world is going to be looking at these events. And the world right now is in the middle of the kind of global crisis that we have certainly not seen in any of our lifetimes. And that global crisis fundamentally is about the vaccine disparity between the global north and the global south. And the idea that an athlete from the Global South or someone from the Global North in solidarity would not be allowed to speak in solidarity with that exposes right. the IOC, especially in the context of the pandemic Olympics. But if an athlete says, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, it will exactly start this uncomfortable conversation in a way that's just not going to happen at any other sporting event, save perhaps the World Cup. Yeah, well, the, what the consequences do also is they filter out the people who are serious from the people who are not serious, because a lot of the people, um, and I'm generalizing here, I'm out my window, I'm sorry I'm distracted, there's a deer running down the street <laughs> outside my window, and my wife gets mad when I say we live out in the country, but I just looked out the window and there's a deer running down the street, so we do live out in the country, but the point is like a lot of... Uh, like the reactionary types that, dom that, that dominate kind of the one pole 
of American politics. I don't know how serious they are about the things they say they're serious about, except for the fact that they are reacting to something else. I don't like this. I don't like that. But now, if you're Mr. Uh, if you're Mr. I don't like the gays and gays shouldn't compete in sports, if you're Mr. I don't like trans and trans athletes shouldn't compete, do you feel that strongly about it to get kicked out of the Olympics? I'm not sure you do. But the people who think Black Lives Matter, they feel that strongly enough about it to risk getting kicked out of the Olympics. So it, it does filter out just a lot of the uh, reactionary, um, reactionary rhetoric, reactionary talk that we hear a lot of. And you know, we'll see again, who's serious and who's willing to run the risk and who, who, who really wants to protest. And again, who just wants to participate in uh, a demonstration that the bosses have facilitated. And the other thing that the Olympic Committee routinely uh, misses the point on is that trying to legislate this type of speech, we've seen this before with Rule 40. And that Rule 40 was a big deal in the 2012 Olympics where uh, the IOC said you, uh, athletes cannot post on social media about brands unless those brands are sponsors of the Olympics. And what you set yourself up for is a, a, a flood of uh, ambush marketing because all these brands that are um, shut out of Rule 40 uh, find ways to get around that ban and they feel challenged and they accept the challenge of finding ways to get around that brand. And then you just also get athletes who say, I'm sponsored by Nike, but Adidas is just an official sponsor. You get in the interview after you win a medal, you say, hey, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor. Who's going to tell me I can't? Are you going to kick me out of the Olympics over me saying this one thing in an interview? So trying to legislate that type of speech almost always backfires. So we will see what happens, but I am not, um, again, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not a, I'm, I'm as, I'm as, I'm as out on legislating speech as I am on uh, safe protests. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, in the meantime, like you, I, uh, as Megan mentioned, and as David alluded to, COVID-19 is not going away. We have uh, Bianca uh, Andrescu, the Canadian tennis star. She has just tested positive. Uh, for COVID-19. So she's out of action for a while. Canada's relay team at the World Relays, uh, which was coming up a little bit later in May uh, in Poland. So Canada now has joined the United States and Jamaica and Trinidad in, in pulling out of that track meet. And this is one of the big, if you're, if, you're a, uh, if you're one of these countries that kind of depends on relays to get medals and depends on relays to get into the Olympics, if you didn't make the finals at the last Olympics or didn't make the finals at the world at world relays last time or world championships. This is your chance to lay down a fast time and qualify. And a lot of these countries have said, we can't go. The COVID risk is too great. Uh, meantime, there's a Canadian bobsledder, um, Alex Kopatz, who is in London, Ontario in hospital. Uh, as of right now, he might still be on oxygen, um, which kind of, uh, sheds light on this myth that if you're young and strong, like physically strong, that you're somehow you're immune to COVID-19. So then you have three fairly high profile uh, cases from different angles of this COVID thing. And so Dave, my question to you is like, 90, 86 days out from the, Olymp from the start of the Olympic games, like how seriously should we be taking this? Look, we should be taking this very seriously. Uh, the Olympics really do think they're too big to fail, and I think they're wrong um, in their conception of whether or not these games are going to go off without a hitch. Because already you described the what's happening with the Canadians. One of the interesting quotes that I saw from the Canadian team was that, you know, this also very much hurts us in terms of just basic preparation for the Olympics. Yes. And our, you know, and so not just about qualification, but actually forging a team that can medal. And so to me, the Olympics are already warped for 2021, not just because they're the 2020 Olympics in 2021, <laughs> but it's, it's already a bit of a warped proposition. So if they think they're too big to fail, I think they're operating from a position of arrogance and not scientific reality. You know, one of the things in looking at all these stories that really surprised me was um, in looking at Bianca's story in particular, was that the WTA does not require vaccines of its players. And I just think we're gonna have to figure out what we think about the requiring of vaccines from professional athletes, people who operate in very coarse, uh, close quarters with one another. I mean, there's a great Italian restaurant right near my house and they're requiring vaccines. Of, of everybody who works at the restaurant, you know, and I think it's a workplace safety issue. And mm -hmm. the if if it's going to be something that uh, that professional sports leagues fall down on, I think they're setting themselves up for a very difficult near future. Yeah, and and, and the vaccine is such a, a, a 
thorny issue because as we discussed last week, a lot of people are hesitant for a lot of different reasons to get vaccines. But at the same time, as you point out, Dave, like professional athletes, they deal with each other at close quarters. They also travel a lot, which means they have uh, risk of getting exposed to the virus. And if they catch it, they risk exposing other people to the virus. Um, and like part of the problem is like, getting somebody to do something for someone else. Like I got my first shot over the weekend, got a bunch of bad headaches and a bunch of fatigue afterward. But for my, me, myself personally, it was a drag, but at the same time, I'm the first person in the house to get vaccinated. And it's something I do for my family and for my neighbors. Um, but asking more people to, to, to undergo that type of discomfort from people other than themselves, that's a, that's, shouldn't be a big ask, but in the real world, it's a big ask. Megan McPeak, like, oh, if you had a, uh, as we discussed offline, a New York Times uh, Olympics likelihood meter pegged to COVID-19, uh, where is the needle pointing right now? Oh, for, for me, this, <laughs> there's no doubt that the uh, Olympics are going to happen one way or another. The IOC is determined for the Olympics to happen. So the New York Times meter, if, if you're asking me right now with, as you mentioned, you know, approximately uh, 86 days from opening ceremonies, uh, it's at 100%, and I don't think it's going to change. I think no matter what, the IOC is going to make sure the 2020 Olympics in 2021 are going to happen. The only way I think it doesn't is if you then see federations begin to completely pull their athletes, not just from you know one sport here and there, but totally. So if you have big countries, Canada, the US, Russia, China, if you see these teams start to pull their athletes completely, I think then the meter starts to drop closer to the zero. But if and until that starts happening, yes, you may see, you know, athletes pull out here and there. I don't think that moves the needle at all. I think it has to be complete countries and federations removing their athletes totally and putting their health and safety at the forefront for the Olympic committee to decide if this still should happen or if they should shut things down and move to what should be and what would be 2024. Uh, but I think this is going to be very interesting. I don't think that meter is going to move. I think no matter what, they're going to try and forge forward with the Olympics one way or another. And this might be m the most interesting Olympics because we may see athletes that we would have probably never seen had it not been for the pandemic. Um, interesting is a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, now, when I, as we discussed last week, uh, my bias is not to want to see the people that I wouldn't normally have seen if all the good people stayed home. I just want to see the best against the best. And we, we are, what we're flirting with is an Olympics of B and C teams, which I don't want to see, but if they feel like they have to have this event, that might be uh, what we wind up with. Dave, you look like you were going to say something. Only that I agree with everything that Megan said, but because I agree with what Megan said, I can't put the meter at 100%. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think it's close to 100%, but the fact that we, we can even discuss the idea of federations pulling out, that we can foresee for the Olympics, federations saying it's not safe, it puts it off 100%. Uh, the idea of the Olympics just not happening, I think is not something that's going to happen, but if you said to me, should there be betting odds on it not happening? I would say, yes, there should be betting odds on it not happening. There's probably you know a sports book like? somewhere ahead, that has Megan. that. <laughs> 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 you know, one, one of the sports books in Vegas probably secretly has that prop bet. Yeah. If not Vegas, definitely uh, England, for sure. Um, but what this reminds me of is, you know, the discussions folks were having last summer about uh, college sports in high school sports, should we have them? And you got a lot of traction for the idea of not having these sports in the fall when people knew less about the coronavirus and how it spread, but when numbers of, when case counts were lower. And they said, well, let's just uh, put it off till spring. And so now like uh, division one, what I used to, what I grew up calling division one AA football, which I think is now football championship subdivision, like North Dakota states of the world. They're playing right now, even though case counts are higher, much higher now than they were last summer. And so these decisions <laughs> on the front end appear to be guided by public safety and case counts, but they're really guided by you know expediency and whether or not people still feel like 
putting these seasons off or canceling them overall. Whereas here in Canada, where there's not a ton of money at stake in college sports, uh, university leagues, college leagues, just looked at the case counts. They're going up. Okay, we're just not having a season period. Bye, we'll see you next year. Um, so I don't, <laughs> for me, myself personally, yes, I think um, the IOC has said, listen, we're going to have these games no matter what, even if the winning time in the men's 100 meters is 10.6 seconds because all the fast people stay home. Um, but I, I'm just struggling with how compelling the competition will really be and how you can sell this as the best against the best if we are laboring under this uh, threat that a lot of the best for safety reasons might stay home. Um, and so I can't predict that, but uh, it is time for in and out um, because we're going to lead off in and out with some predictions. And this week we go to Meg, we go to Megan McPeak for our way too early prediction. And we go to Megan McPeak because she said explicitly, these are the words that came out of her mouth uh, during the offline discussion. I hate way too early predictions. Okay, well, if you hate them, <laughs> you can get this one out of the way right now. So this week or this past week, uh, WNBA training camp started up. And um, Megan McPeak is our resident expert on all things basketball, but especially on WNBA because she's the play-by-play -play voice of the Washington Mystics. So we're going to go to Megan McPeak for her way too early prediction on WNBA season. Training camps are open. Who wins the championship and why, Megan? Uh, I think given the intro, you already know and listeners and viewers know where this is going. The Washington Mystics will be the 2021 WNBA <laughs> champions. Uh, and we will actually get a rematch of the 2018, both teams at full strength. It will be Seattle and it will be the Mystics going head to head in a rematch. And the Mystics will be raising their second banner in three years. Okay, wait a minute. Can you give me a reason that Washington is going to win this a little bit, a little bit more concrete than they're going to win because I'm their play-by-play -play voice? <laughs> well, so... Like now I'm sure, I'm, Megan, now this is not to say I'm sure your voice on the microphone is worth like 12 points a game to the Mystics, but <laughs> a little bit more concrete, please. No, so obviously we, we know what happened with the wobble season. A lot of players, for whatever reason, they decided to opt out. Uh, Elena Deladon opted out due to medical reasons, so she did not play uh, in that season. Tina Charles got a medical exempt, did not play. Natasha Cloud opted out for personal reasons uh, as well, too. And you had a team that was not the reigning and defending WNBA champions. They get all three of those back. You return Tina Charles, an MVP. You return Elena Deladon, an MVP and finals MVP on three herniated discs, might I add. You get a Natasha Cloud returning as well, too, uh, who is one of the best defenders in the league itself. So you return everything you didn't have, but also, too, you have a roster that will be a difficult decision for head coach and general manager Mike Tebow to dwindle down, uh, a job that I'm currently not envious of having at this moment. But you have the ability to take the roster that you had from the bubble season, and you know what you're getting from these players because you didn't have the talent that I just mentioned in that season. So you know what these players can do. Now you can plug and play, and you return these players back. We don't know uh, still the the situation with Emma Meese. I mean, she has a lot, a lot of uh, international responsibilities to deal with. So she's still on the cloud bubble of what she's going to be with the Mystics this season. We may or may not see her, but let's pretend we don't see her. You still have Elena Deladon, Tina Charles, and Natasha Cloud returning. Yes, there has been a lot of movement in the offseason, but I will not be surprised if we have a rematch of the 2018 finals for that reason. But don't be surprised if Chicago is in the mix as well. Don't be surprised if the Sparks sneak into the playoffs. You know, they lose Candace Parker in free agency, but they have the return of Christy Tolliver, who's a two-time champion and one of the best point guards, combo guards in this league. So this is probably, I think, going to be one of the most exciting seasons in the WNBA that we will have. And it also could be one of the seasons that comes down to not only the final game of regular season, but as well too, we could potentially see a lot of, you know, final game of the series and game three situations and game five situations when it comes to the playoffs. But I have a Seattle Mystics uh, rematch of 2018 with the Mystics winning. Mm, okay. Is that concrete enough for you, Morgan. <laughs> That's concrete. <laughs> and again, 
with Megan on the mic, that's like Washington starting each game uh, up 12 nothing. Dave Zyron, you uh, in I or think, out? I think Elena gives them a little bit more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Zyron, you in or out on that prediction? I'm so in, it's ridiculous. I'm so in, I would have to climb up a thousand feet from the depths of the earth to be out of that prediction. Look, we're big Washington Mystics fans in this house, but it's more than that. They didn't get the chance to truly defend their title, and they feel that. And so they, they, not, they are not only, in their minds, the defending champions, they have a chip on their shoulder the size of the Capitol building. So I'm all in on the Washington Mystics. Interesting. Well, first of all, like, you guys hit on one of my sports pet peeves. There is no such thing as a reigning or defending champion in a non-fight sport. You have mm. a competition for a given year. You settle the championship. The champion is the champion for that year. The next year is a new competition. Who no. is the 2021 uh, World Series champ right now? There is none. What you have is last year's champ. This year's champ, there is no champ. Boxing, I have the title. I bring it with me between fights, and I have it until you beat me for it. All these other sports, you have a championship for a given year. I win the championship. The next year is a new competition. There is no champion. There is no champion because if 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 I lose, if I am uh, if I am the World Series champion in 2021, sorry, in, in 2020, and I don't win the World Series this year, I'm still the 2020 champion. I'm not the former champion. I'm the 2020 champion. Uh, but the point is, uh, I'm out. Pardon me. Counterpoint, the 1995 Houston Rockets, fifth seed, wins a return championship defending their 94 title. Rudy oh, they won. Mike, never underestimate the heart of a champion. <laughs> no, that, that I would say, counter counterpoint, uh, you repeat <laughs> as champions. And to me, it's, and to me, uh, laying out and making clear that repeat, that someone has repeated as champion, uh, gives more justice to the idea of, of how difficult it is to repeat as a champion. Because understand, you don't get any credit as the champion, right? You won last year's championship. You don't get an easier path to next year's championship. Most times in, in, a, in a pro league, you get a harder schedule. It's much easier. It's much more difficult to repeat as a champion than to be a champion already and be like, I'm still reigning champion. Because if I'm reigning boxing champion, I could also choose my next op opponent. Give me the number 10 contender instead of the number one contender. Give me this other guy instead of unifying the title. But like in the NBA, NFL, I don't get credit just because I won the title last year and it was making it easier for me to win it the next year. Like repeating as champion, that actually lays out how difficult it is to, to be that good and stay that good. We've talked too much. I'm in on Megan's prediction because I trust Megan on the WNBA. I trust Megan on the NBA too. Like I said, I just leap into basketball at playoff time. So I'm just now starting to get caught up on what's happening in the mainstream NBA. Simone Biles has dumped Nike. She is signed with Atleta, who is uh, The Gap. It's their women's activewear brand. So two things about this is one, uh, when you see Simone Biles out, you know, uh, in the mall or wherever, when we're allowed to see people in, in public again, uh, she'll be rocking Atleta and not Nike. And two, she's embarking on her own tour, <laughs> right? Post Olympics, because USA Gymnastics, they get, they, according to the New York Times, uh, they gross $13, 14000000 million in, in the, the, in the months following any Olympics based on these tours where they take these Olympic stars and put them out on tour. And what Simone Biles has said is, I'm organizing my own tour. I'm going to take the Olympic stars out on tour and Atleta is going to back us. Uh, Megan McPeak, are you in or out on Simone Biles sticking it to Nike and to USA I Gymnastics? I'm 100% in on her taking control of her power. This is, I think, you know, she has to do what's best. And if she feels that Athleta is a better brand for her, for what she stands for, not only as a gymnast, but as well, too, as a as a woman in sports, as a black woman in the world, I think that she has to do what's best for her. I wholeheartedly support her on this decision. If she likes Athleta, you know what? Good for you. Do what you want and do what you want to do with your power, because at the end of the day, yeah, you might have the brand behind you, but you're kind of their power, like, you're you're their you're their go. So go Absolutely. go some old miles. <laughs> Absolutely. Dave Zyre, you in or out. Oh, I'm so in on this. It's absurd. And we, we can't overestimate what a blow this is for Nike. Uh, Simone Biles is on the short list, and we don't talk about her nearly enough, I don't think, as the most important athlete of the last 20, 30 years in terms of what she brings to her sport. She creates moves that no one else can do. And then they are, they are named after her. So I think it's a hell of a blow to Nike and a hell of a lift for Atleta. And joining any organization that employs Allison Felix is always going to mm -hmm. be. 
One hundred percent. I'm all the way in on this move day for this for the same reasons you guys both mentioned, um, and two for the fact that Simone Biles recognizes like how small these windows are for for Olympic athletes to make money, and she is unusually famous for an Olympic athlete and for a, a, an Olympic gymnast, especially on the women's side. Uh, those windows of opportunities are so small, and it's so rare to see you know an Olympic women's gymnast who's over the age of say twenty. Here she is at twenty four, going through her second Olympic cycle. Uh, still on top of her game. And she recognized how rare that is. And this is a rare opportunity to cash in. So if there's money out there to be made, it might as well go to the people that are uh, putting their bodies on the line instead of these decision makers, especially at USA Gymnastics, who, you know, if you if you read or heard the stories about Larry Nasser and about Camp Caroli have uh, systematically done so done so wrong by so many of these women that keep that organization on the map and keep that organization making money. It is beyond past time that the biggest stars have, have said and made moves uh, to leverage their own power instead of letting these decision makers who have shown they don't really care about these athletes keep making that money. Last one, um, Dave Zirin last week, and we were discussing uh, Super League European footy and how out we all were on that idea. And Dave said, wait a minute, there might be another shoe to drop because I think fan protests uh, could stop this thing and it's tracked. Lo and behold, it happened. And Dave Stradamus predicted it. Uh, everybody give a shout out to Dave for seeing three days into the future because none of us saw three days into the future. All of us were over here panicking about what would happen to European League footy. And in the wake of that, uh, in the wake of the near dissolution of the Super League, you have JP Morgan, US Investment Bank, who was going to bankroll the whole thing. Now they are apologizing having tried to bankroll the whole thing. Here's a here's a, a, a quote from J.P. Morgan's spokesperson, an unnamed spokesperson in the New York Times. Uh, and you guys, I want you to listen to this and hear it in your mind's ear with like a slow violin playing, you know, to go with the contrition. Clearly we misjudged how this deal will be viewed by the wider football community and how it might impact the future. We will learn from this. Megan McPeak, you're in or out on, on corporate contri corporate contrition in this case. They should have never put themselves in this position in the first place. Like, come on. <laughs> come on. At what like at what point did someone not raise their hand and be like, um, do we want to rethink this? Because I feel like it's going to backfire if we don't think of the fans. And sure enough, it did. Uh, but I'm I'm in on them with what they want to call an apology i'm out on the <laughs> fact that they should have never been in this position to begin with <laughs> see if only they could have seen into the future like dave did then they'd be yeah fine. they should have called dave <laughs> exactly <laughs> dave's yeah. iron you enter you in or out on on jp morgan's corporate contrition i'm laughing too hard to even <laughs> say the words in or out look this is jp morgan they paid a 13 billion dollar settlement to the u.s government following their role in the 2008 financial crisis and pointedly did not apologize but yet for this they apologize and it just gives you an idea of that very very lethal combination of rebellion and revulsion that <laughs> the soccer world otherwise known as the world when faced with this super league <laughs> yeah, listen, Dave, I'm all the way out on on this type of contrition because it's so uh, transparently not genuine. They're an investment bank and they don't have to, as much as we might abhor their lack of ethics, they also don't have to like apologize for doing what they do. Like some guys came to you and said, hey, we have this idea. We think it's going to make a ton of money. Uh, bankroll it for us. And they looked at it and said, ooh, this is going to make a ton of money. Let's bankroll it. And then it blew up in their face. So instead of apologizing to us for this thing blowing up in your face, just say, hey, look, we gambled. We bet wrong. It happens because that's the business you guys are in. Like, don't, 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 don't pretend that you're going to be something else uh, after this than you were before this because you're not. Because when the next person comes to you with some idea that you think is going to make a lot of money, no matter how many people it offends, um, you're going to sign the check. So <laughs> don't They should have bet on black. <laughs> exactly. Or at least bet on Dave Zirin. Like I bet on Dave Zirin every week because I know he's going to come through with the blazing hot takes. This is why these are my favorite 40-ish minutes of every week. As usual, guys, it's been a pleasure. Uh, 
I was a little bit groggy this week because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking off the effects of the AstraZeneca vaccine plus uh, allergies, but um, I'm doing good. And I'm always, always, always happy to reconnect with Dave and Megan on these Monday mornings. Dave Zirin, uh, tell the folks where they can find you between episodes. Well, first and foremost, you can reach me on Twitter at Edge of Sports anytime. And second, unless Megan knows of this already being used, I want a copyright going like this if you're a Mystics fan. I do not know if that's been copywritten, so you might be on to something here. Perfect. Walk down the streets of DC like this and see what happens. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll pause. May <laughs> Megan McPeak, tell the people where they can find you between episodes. On Twitter, at Megan McPeak, spelled with an H because it's the right way to do it. You know it. Perfect. And uh, as usual, I've been your host, Morgan Campbell, at Morgan P. Campbell on Twitter, at Morgan P. Campbell on Instagram. I'm not on TikTok or Triller or any of these other ones, not even on Facebook anymore. So those are the two places to find me if you want to continue these discussions. As usual, if you like what you saw, hit like. If you dislike what you saw, hit dislike. We don't care. Leave a comment either way. All engagements matter. We're trying to feed the algorithm. And so until next week, this has been your host, Morgan Campbell, for Bring It In.